Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci fi. If you love to read, this is the podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Welcome to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah. I am happy to be with you. It is Tuesday, and I hope you're having a good week so far. I hope you had a great weekend. My weekend was interesting, I guess, would be a good word for it. So my husband and I are moving, and more on that later. That, that's 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 more of a, of a complicated story. We're moving. Anyway, we started to um, sell a few things in the house to help facilitate that move and, you know, declutter a little bit. And so it was just a crazy weekend. It kind of felt like our house was a yard sale it's, because no matter when we scheduled people to come look at, at furniture, they always seemed to show up at the same time. And so we would have these brief spurts of like craziness and people everywhere and then and then nothing. And then we'd schedule a couple other people to come at different times and they'd all come at the same time. <laughs> so actually one of those times was during my interview with Joanne. And so I had people downstairs with my husband while I was upstairs trying to record. And it wasn't the fault of the people downstairs, but we had so many technical difficulties. <laughs> Joanne was very, very patient and I was so appreciate appreciative of her patience. At any rate, um, Joanne McLean is the author with whom I'm speaking today. She uh, writes under the name J.P. McLean, and she'll say more about that in the interview. We are talking about her new book. It's called Bloodmark. What if your lifelong curse is the only thing keeping you alive? Abandoned at birth, life has always been a battle for Jane Walker. She and her best friend, Sadie, spent years fighting to survive Vancouver's cutthroat underbelly. That would have been tough enough without Jane's mysterious afflictions. An intricate pattern of blood-red birthmarks that snake around her body and vivid, heart-wrenching nightmares that feel so real she wakes up screaming. After she meets the first man who isn't repulsed by her birthmarks, Jane thinks she might finally have a chance at happiness. Her belief seems confirmed as the birthmarks she spent her life so ashamed of magically begin to disappear. Yet the quicker her scarlet marks vanish, the more lucid and disturbing Jane's nightmares become, until it's impossible to discern her dreams from reality. And Jane comes to a horrifying realization. The nightmares that have plagued her since childhood are actually visions of real people being stalked by a deadly killer. And all this time, her birthmarks have been the only things protecting her from becoming his next victim. So this is the first book in a new series that Joanne is writing, so that's exciting, and you've got a lot of different elements happening. You've got a a woman who's had a very difficult life, made more difficult by the fact that she has narcolepsy narcolepsy and sleep paralysis uh, caused by these nightmares that she experiences, very vividly experiences. She also has these birthmarks that... She tries to keep covered as much as possible, but it's difficult to do and people are often repulsed at the very, uh, you know, put off at the very least, but often repulsed by them. So she's just had, you you can imagine that she grew up in foster care in in that system and, and plus she's got the birthmarks, plus she's got these terrifying dreams. You can imagine that she's got a few trust issues and some issues with relationships. So part of the story is her navigating a lot of that. She's got her best friend Sadie. She does meet someone, um, his name is Ethan, with whom she feels she might be able to have a romantic relationship. But at the same time, all of these other things are happening. Her birthmarks that she hates start disappearing yay, but um, they're the only thing protecting her from uh, potentially being murdered. So not so yay. (laughs) Did you like that grammatically correct uh, sentence right there? Not so yay. A lot is happening. And Jane as a main character really does 
have a lot a, a lot to overcome, but that makes her even more interesting, I think, and makes the story more compelling. So let's go ahead and uh, do the interview with with uh, Joanne so she can tell you more about the book and the series. Again, the book is called Blood Mark. Hi, Joanne. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Sarah. Lovely to be here. Thanks for asking me. I am happy to have you here and excited to talk about your book, Blood Mark. Before we get to the book, though, if you would like to share a little bit about yourself, I would appreciate it. Sure. Well, my name is Joanne. I write under J.P. McLean because Joanne is spelt so many different ways, and I want to be found on the Internet. So hence the J.P. P is for Patricia, which is my middle name. And I write full time from my home on Denman Island, which is on the west coast of British Columbia. And my preferred genre to write in is supernatural thrillers. Would you give an overview of Bloodmark? Oh, I'd love to. I'd love to. So Bloodmark is a supernatural thriller, and it tells the story of a woman named Jane Walker. Now, Jane has been born with three strikes against her. First of all, she was abandoned at birth. She bears blood red birthmarks that snake around her body, and she suffers from debilitating nightmares. And in these nightmares, she sees into the past and she sees nasty deeds done by people, uh, two people that she knows. So it, they're disturbing dreams for her. So she's absolutely thrilled when um, mysteriously her birthmarks begin to disappear one by one. That is, until she learns that a killer is stalking her, and those marks are the only things keeping her alive. Yeah, it's um, th- there's a lot of there's a lot going on for Jane, uh, poor thing. But it's <laughs> it's ironic because she hates these birthmarks, absolutely hates them, wants them to go away, and then suddenly they do start going away. And oops, <laughs> no, you really would like to keep those. Yeah. Um, so irony right there. But um, what was yeah. your initial inspiration for the book? The initial inspiration was a scene that um, anyone who is a fan of that series uh, Blind Spot might recognize. And that was the opening scene of the very first season when Jane uh, is dumped into Times Square in a duffel bag. And they think it's a bomb. The police think it's a bomb. So they send a guy in to unzip the bag and out out pops this woman who's tattooed from the neck down. And she doesn't remember where she got those tattoos or when or what they're all about. She's completely oblivious to it. And I was really struck by that opening scene. I thought that was very uh, intriguing to me. So I had that in the back of my mind, I guess, for a number of years. And when I was searching for a new character, the idea that this woman would have this mark that she couldn't hide that uh, would affect her so deeply was something that I kept in mind for for this character. Let's talk a little bit more about Jane. Um, She's the main character, although the book is told from a few different perspectives and points of view. But what about Jane do you think will resonate with readers? I think that readers will appreciate uh, or, or it will resonate with them that she comes from a challenging background and is trying so hard to overcome that and find her place in society. So she grows up in uh, group homes in the child welfare system. She meets uh, her best and fiercest friend, Sadie. They both have, uh, they both have issues. Sadie's the opposite of Jane in many ways because she is beautiful and she has doors open for her because she is beautiful, but she's still scrappy. She still is, grows up on the street and um, and they find each other, they support each other and they uh, they live together. It starts, they're living together in a, in a tiny little one bedroom apartment when the story opens. And we learn fairly quickly that Sadie likes to make a little extra money by being a hooker on the side. So she's got a job as a waitress, but the hooker pays a lot better than than the waitress part of her. So I really liked playing those two characters off against one another. And I think not that people are going to, you know, resonate. The hooker part is not going to resonate with a lot of people. But I just think the the differences between the two and how they um, they're just like regular people, girls, when they first, you know, when they're in college or get the first apartment, when they're. Uh, you know, just testing their personalities are a little bit different. You know, I, I made Jean, I made Jean, Jane, 
<laughs> what was it? Jean. I made Jane to be neat and tidy and, and uh, Sadie to be messy because those two things I, I find are fun together. And um, mm. and it, both of them are non-judgmental. I really thought that if you grew up like that in that kind of a system, you would learn to be non-judgmental because you would typically be the one being judged. So I thought that mm -hmm. was a yeah, I thought that was a fun thing to, to have. Wouldn't it be nice to know more people who are truly non-judgmental? And I include myself in that because no matter how hard I try to be non-judgmental, I, I don't always succeed. So uh, we're going to go ahead and take our first break of the podcast. When we come back, we'll be talking more about the supernatural, paranormal uh, aspects of this book. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Are you tired of the same old news? Are you sick of the seemingly endless political spin and negativity? The GSMC America Still Beautiful podcast is a weekly news podcast covering all the top positive and uplifting news stories. We cover stories that will inspire, uplift, and remind you of the good in the world. Tune into the Golden State Media Concepts America Still Beautiful podcast to get all the great and positive news stories of today. Download the GSMC America Still Beautiful podcast on iTunes. Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. I am speaking today with author J.P. McLean about her new novel, Bloodmark. Let's go ahead and return to the interview. So it's, it's, para, it's paranormal, it's supernatural in that Jane has this sort of mystical ability and the marks are protecting her. Um, but it doesn't it doesn't really cross the line into fantasy or much magical realism. How did you decide how much, how much, uh, I'm trying to figure out how to, how to phrase this, but <laughs> how far to go toward kind of the fantasy or supernatural side of things? Well, part of it has to do with developing the character um, within the story, because I did want to make sure that this character and this story was different than the um, the series I did prior to this. So I, I wrote a, a supernatural series prior to this, and there was a lot of supernatural. People could fly and they could do these other things. They had powers, uh, so to speak. So in this one, I wanted to make sure it was different, which is why there are three points of view and it's told from the third person, whereas the other books were all uh, first person told from one person's perspective. So um, I, I was purposely making it different so, so I didn't, um, I didn't give her as much supernatural, but I did something different in this. There's a little bit of time slip in this book, um, which I never explored in the other books, and that was really fascinating because I do think in my head that if you were uh, like everything that the fact that you and I are talking right now in this point in time on this equipment, and we're in the places we're in. Um, that, that we have connected is contingent on so many other things. Um, and if one of those things was different, you know, if I didn't meet Mickey, the publicist who set this up, if you didn't have the equipment, um, if somebody else had taken the spot, we wouldn't be having this conversation. So I really like the idea that if you could just tweak one tiny thing in history, how does that impact ripple out through the present day. And I explored that a little bit in this book. And of course, the devastating or, um, devastating results of that tinkering with the yeah. past. Yeah. And it was just a, a tiny little thing that didn't seem, you know, that, that big in the grand scheme of things. Yeah. I always find stories that involve any kind of, whether it's time travel or, you know, time time slippage, whatever, fascinating because there are so many different ways that you can go with that and, and, and areas to explore. I, I laugh because growing up, I, I watched Star Trek Next Generation with my dad. Um, <laughs> and 
well, I always knew that if there was any episode that had any kind of time travel in it, as soon as the episode was over, my sister would, the phone would ring and my sister would call and she'd be like, wait, what? Now, how? They went back, but wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> I try not to think too much about time travel or the, those kinds of things because then my brain starts to hurt. Yeah, yeah. Um, how do you, in terms of writing, though, keep track of those kinds of things? You know, you've got you've got the the story before the time slippage, and then the story after. And and are you a I guess are you a plotter or a pantser? How do you keep track of those kinds of details? This book was really difficult to keep track of because of the time slip. So I'm I'm I started off as a pantser when I first started writing, but as the series grew, I had to get much more diligent about keeping track of um, what was happening and what was going to happen in order to get the storylines to all tie together in the end. So I, I'm definitely an outliner now, and this was this book was outlined, and what I what I had difficulty with was um, when she has these debilitating dreams, she is dreaming of things that happened in the past. So getting those dreams in the right place so that the past events happened in the right point in time of the telling of the story was the most complicated thing I've ever done. I got it wrong. Uh, it was, I thought I had it right. But I'd been moving stuff around trying to make it make sense. And it wasn't until the editor pointed out, she said, wait a second, this doesn't make sense. And then she was writing that this happened on such and such a day. And then this happened on such and such a day. So this couldn't have happened on this day. And I was like, oh, my God, now I have to go back in and change, <laughs> change all that. Because I did do it. Um, like her birth, her birthmarks are disappearing and it's connected to a date and so i wanted the countdown to that date to add to the tension so the dates are the countdown is in the story as is um each each character's point of view has a each character has a chapter when it's their point of view so um yeah this one was really difficult to put together and um and it tripped me up it did trip me up so i i I'm pretty sure the um, like the the reviews I'm getting now and the feedback I'm getting now are are thank God I fixed it up so it's, <laughs> it looks it looks like it's working. <laughs> Can you imagine though if this was in um, the time before computers and you know word documents and those things when you would have to go and 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 rearrange chunks of time in your book like with the actual physical paper? I can't imagine, or even a typewriter. <laughs> Can you imagine having yeah. to retype on a on a manual typewriter all this stuff? Boy, no. Hemingway no, and all these you. older people they they certainly <laughs> they had it yeah they had it hard. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Let's let's talk a little bit more about the those points of view. So it's it's Jane and her roommate Sadie, and then uh, a character named Rick. And I don't want to give too much away about Rick, but what was the, what went into your decision to write from those particular points of view? Well, I think, again, I was just making sure I was being different from what I wrote before. And it was a challenge. You know, that was the other part of it was as a writer, it's nice to challenge yourself. And I think I had, after having written seven books in first person perspective, I think I had kind of figured it out. <laughs> I was I was pretty comfortable with it. So switching to third person and, and using more than one perspective, I thought would give me more flexibility. And it certainly did give me more flexibility to tell the story because it would be a pretty difficult story to tell from just Jane's perspective, I, I think. So having Sadie be able to give uh, a little bit of color to the story and add her perspective and then have Rick as the sinister voice in the background, uh, I, I think just added to the story and made it more interesting, uh, probably both from the reader's perspective, but from my perspective as a writer, I found it uh, a very interesting and challenging way to go. Mm -hmm. Did you do any particular types of research for the book? Oh, tons. Oh, tons. Uh, it's it's interesting that <clears throat> I think people think that when you write fiction, it's all made up anyway. So why would you have to research <laughs> it? But there right. is so there it's there's there's so much to research um in this particular one i um i've lived in vancouver i said it in vancouver and i've lived there so i know the city for fairly well but i still have a map in my 
um, my documents. I have a map with pins on it of all the different places that I'm talking about. And I know how to get from one pin to the, to the next. I know the streets. Um, I Googled them. So I Google Earth them because <clears throat> I haven't lived there in quite a while just to make sure I knew uh, where everything was. So that was you know, like just the physical setting research. But in terms of her blood marks, I did a lot of research on uh, port wine stains and um, how you could uh, possibly get rid of them if you wanted to get rid of them. Because, of course, who wouldn't if they had that and they were that uh, prominent on your face, um, you would probably look into how you have them fixed or removed or whatever uh, you wanted to have done with them. So I did a lot of research on that. And then um, given Sadie's role uh, as, as a prostitute, I wanted to um, find one that was convenient for her to do just once in a while. And I did some research on the teacher's pet websites um, and and also interviews uh, with former prostitutes on YouTube. Um, very interesting, very interesting uh, research in that regard. Um, and then I also knew I wanted to have some kind of tie into an ancient civilization. So I did some research on that and um, and came up with the Inca culture. And a lot of people are, are quite familiar with the uh, the ruins and some of the artifacts that you can find. And I do mention some websites in that in the book, and those are real websites you can go to and take a look at the artifacts that I'm describing in the story. So I like putting a little bit of that in it. It makes it more believable, more real to me. In terms of those artifacts and the believability and reality of, of those, I really appreciate that um, Joanne included websites, actual websites that you can go to and look up. The same thing is that Jane is looking up in the book when she's doing some research. The professor gives her some websites to look at in terms of the, the Incan aspects, the 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 bowl and the marks, um, et cetera. And so I really appreciate that she did that. So for people who are interested and are maybe wanting to know a little bit more about the Incan culture that inspired some parts of this book, you can go to those websites and uh, do some research for yourself. So we're going to go ahead and take our next break of the podcast. When we come back, we'll be talking about character development. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. the GSMC Book Review Podcast. I am speaking today with author J.P. McLean about her new book, Bloodmark. When it comes to your characters, do you have a pretty good idea of those characters when you start writing, or do you prefer that they develop as you write? Where do you fall on that spectrum? I know the basics about them when I start writing. So I knew that they... Uh, both of them would come from uh, the lower echelons of society. Uh, I knew that they would be um, in the child welfare welfare system. And I knew a little bit about uh, the downtown east side in Vancouver, where a lot of homeless people live. And um, so I knew those basic things. Some of the more fine tuning of the characters comes as I'm writing. 
So the idea that Jane would be neat and tidy and Sarah would be uh, messy was something that came to me as I was writing. So when those ideas come to me, I can then go back and add reinforcement to those ideas. So the whole idea, I think right in the beginning, I described their, um, their two dressers that sit side by side in the bedroom. And that detail I added after when I realized it would be fun to have Sadie be a little bit, not a little bit, but a lot messy like she sleeps with her makeup on and she um ends up with having to smell her clothes to see if they're clean because she doesn't know they're just all bunched up on the floor whereas jane is the opposite so though those little details i i can go back and and reinforce adding details and i find that fun i like i do write in layers i I tend to, to write and then as I come up with things, I go back and add a layer of color to it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that 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 layer of color actually I I'm kind of cracked me up because there's a point in the book where Jane isn't around as much and Sadie realizes just how much Jane cleans up after her. <laughs> kind of gross in their apartment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, just little touches of realism is nice. Yeah, yeah. I think it's very much like uh, what what it's like when you live with someone. Like even when you when when my husband and I first started living together, it's just getting used to how someone else lives. It's yes. it's a challenge sometimes. Yeah, yeah. My husband and I have been married almost 10 years and we're still getting used to certain things. So, <laughs> we're, so true. We're working on it. <laughs> So true. I like to find the humor in that stuff too, because I, I think that um, I, I love adding humor to a book. There's got to be mm-hmm. some some funny stuff that happens because life is funny sometimes. It is. It, it is, whether it is intentional or not. Yeah. Like the one part I, I remember going back and adding was uh, when Jane is standing in the kitchen in the scene and she says, does she even know we own a broom? <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I don't think he my, probably does. In my head, I'm thinking, this, does he know that there's a clean dish rag underneath the counter? <laughs> <sighs> yes. <laughs> don't say those things out loud. <laughs> well, yeah, no, not usually. Um, you mentioned living in Vancouver for a time. Are there, um, well, and, you know, dish dish rag, clean dish rags under the counter, but are there uh, particular autobiographical elements that you like to include in your writing? I, I, I do tend to put little things of me in the characters. Um, sometimes like for the first book, it was just easier um, for me to make the character have some of my attributes. Cause I like um, in the first book, it's her, name, her name is Emmeline and she has no sense of direction, which is me. I So I knew how to write that. I knew what it felt like to be lost all the time. And I gave her this messy hair, which I have. And that was easy too, because I didn't have to think about it. I didn't have to research it. So um, in this book, um, she's not at all physically, uh, like she doesn't have my physical attributes, but I am annoyingly neat. And so I gave her that because I know how to play off against that. So again, it's, it's, I get, maybe it's lazy writing. I don't know, but it just, <laughs> it gives me something that I know so well, it's easy. I, I know how annoying that is. And I didn't want her to be perfect. I wanted her to have some annoying habits. So I gave her that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, this is the first in a series. So do you have an arc in mind or are you going to just kind of write until you feel like you've written all of Jane's story? Yeah, I'm I'm definitely not going to make the mistake I made with the first book. Um, the first time I thought I had a trilogy and well, I thought I had a one off and then I, then I had a trilogy and then the fourth book ruined the trilogy and then it just kept going. So this one, I'm just calling it a series because I know there is at least one more book in there. I've already started writing it, actually. Mm-hmm. Um and the so the what I want there to be, there will be some elements that carry through, um, and I'm not going to uh, you know talk too much about what those elements are. But the one mm-hmm. um, the one thing that I from the at the first book there is an offering bowl that plays a significant role in that first book, but we never know what happened to that offering bowl, and that is the the one key piece I'm bringing into the second book. And I don't know if it'll end up going to the third book or not. I, I have 
some ideas of how it might go into a third book, but I want each book to be a standalone, complete story that you can walk away from and not feel like you have to get the next book to be satisfied. Mm -hmm. it, it, it makes me smile a little bit as you were talking about your first series that, you know, was one book and then three and then four. <laughs> I feel like this, gen this genre just lends itself to, to that. It, you very rarely find standalone books in this genre. So, um, I don't know, maybe maybe they just grow on their own. Yeah. Well, there's so many places you can take them when you're when you're dealing with supernatural. You, you, I mean, you you make it up. <laughs> so you can yeah. really you can um like I could give her some different she could come into some new powers or um you know, new new abilities or or pass things on. I mean, this this offering bowl could get used for various reasons so i mean there's just the sky's the limit it's not like you have to stay within the confines of um, the natural world you can take it wherever you want to and that's the fun part about writing this genre i love this genre for that reason mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so what are you working on now are you working on the next book in this series are you working on something else yeah, I am working on the next book in this series, and I'm um, the, when I'm writing, I typically spend a lot of time outlining. And when I'm outlining, I I typically don't write; I just jot down ideas, and that happens continuously throughout the day. So I, I've been doing that since because you know this book has been finished for a while now. So I've been jotting down ideas, and I think I finally have it into um, pretty good shape. There's still a little bit mushy bits in the middle that I have to solidify but um but yeah i started writing it um i've got uh, the first chapter and uh a bit done and i know where it's going so it, it's it's in it's starting off strong i'm very happy with with how it's starting off so that's good i've also just put out a christmas novella so that was fun yeah uh, and is that also supernatural or is that a different genre well, of course it's supernatural. <laughs> yeah. the, the funny part with that was um, I had I had for quite some time thought it would be really fun to put out a, uh, a novella and short stories I find challenging. So a novella is kind of halfway between it. Well, not halfway, but it's 20,000 words. So a regular book of mine is usually 90 to 100,000. So it's considerably shorter. But um, coming up with a a Christmas theme that a Christmas story that was not um, too dark was difficult for me, which I found surprising. But I guess mm -hmm. I'm darker than I thought because I think the first two ideas that I had, my critique partners looked at me and said, "That is so sad. It's not Christmas." <laughs> so, <laughs> so it took it took three tries, but I finally found one that um, that I that I went with, and um, and it was fun. It was fun to write it you know a new a new short story with um with new characters and uh yeah so that's out there this this christmas and uh yeah i'll probably just put it out at christmas time and then pull it back because i don't know if people buy christmas stories when it's not christmas time um well we listen to christmas music when it's not christmas time so i don't see why not yeah well, i shall keep that in mind <laughs> <laughs> Well, you never know. Maybe those characters will decide that they need uh, a full-length novel or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah one yeah. of the things that in in Bloodmark that I, I I again it's that layering idea is um, I didn't realize until I was probably three quarters through it that one of the themes that I was uh, playing with was beauty and what is beauty and the whole idea of um, the attributes that society gives to beautiful people and and vice versa even if they're not earned and um, and that was also something that I ran back uh, after I had come up with that, um, solidified it and actually wrote it down, what is beauty, I then went back and um, and added layers to that as well. The whole idea that um, the the woman who is the um, the madame in this or the um, the pimp, uh, she is pristine. She's always in white or cream, and her hair is never out of place. And yet she's a madame, you know, and um, I made uh, Jane, who is good, and, and the other character, Buddy, or Dylan, who is good, 
I made them less than uh, appealing uh, to start off with. So I just thought that was a fun theme to play around with. Time to take our third and final break of the podcast. I will confess to you, though, that even though I read the book and I noticed that um, the character of Cynthia was dressed in white a lot, it never really occurred to me that that was a character device or a, a you know, a, a writing device. I apparently was oblivious. So it's nice. It's nice when authors tell you stuff that you should have picked up in the book because otherwise I would just not notice these things. <sighs> okay, taking that final break of the podcast. Stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. Pets bring such joy to our lives, and the GSMC Pets Podcast is here to share in that joy. We'll tell stories of pets finding their forever homes, acting in unexpected ways, being helpful, or just being silly. Whether you love dogs, cats, llamas, reptiles, fish, or you've never met an animal you didn't like, the GSMC Pets Podcast is for you. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and the conclusion of my interview with author J.P. McLean. Yeah, and um, it, it comes up and there's a, a relationship between Jane and Ethan, and they have a little bit of that as well because they, neither of them would consider themselves pristine, but they um, recognize each other's flaws if you will you know um physical flaws and accept them and i think that that's a really good kind of start to their relationship mm -hmm. yeah 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 and that's the other thing is what is family and that's throughout this book too because um there is the family that you are born into and the one that you make for yourself exactly yeah yeah so in terms of writing is it something that you've always wanted to do? Did you come to that decision later in life? How did you start writing for publication? I started writing after my husband and I had spent five years, uh, we'd spent five winters in the South in nice warm weather and sunny weather. And we were back for our first winter back on the coast. And um, I, I honest to goodness, didn't know what on earth I was gonna do with my time. And so I started playing around. I had been reading a lot of urban fantasy and paranormal books. And so I just started playing around with the notion of uh, a woman who could fly. And um, so my husband was watching hockey and I was typing away on my laptop and um, I discovered how much I loved it. I had, I had always written technical stuff prior to that for work. Uh, job descriptions and procedure manuals and that kind of thing. And so it was really fun to play with fiction and uh, kind of expand my horizons uh, imaginatively and not have to stick to facts, which was fun. So that that's how I started writing. So I, I actually, it was not something I thought I, I would do. I thought it would be nice to be able to be a writer. I remember slogging through the snow and slush in Toronto on my way to work thinking, oh, would it be nice just to sit at home and be able to work from home in my pajamas with a cup of coffee? But I didn't think I'd ever have an idea big enough for a book. So it did surprise me. Um, and I guess that's because I never realized that you didn't have to have the whole book in your head when you started writing. You, you just had to have a little a little idea and grow it from there. So that was a nice revelation. Mm -hmm. And from that, uh, that 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 sounds like the beginning of an answer to this next question. But um, do you have advice for aspiring authors? Yeah, yeah, I guess you're right. That would be my advice is don't think if you if you're interested in writing, don't think you need to have that um, the whole book just start writing that one scene and play around with words. And if you discover that you enjoy it as much as I do, then you probably have a book or two in you. And it's a, it's a really 
good way to uh, flex your imagination muscle. And it's one of the most fulfilling things that I do. And I, I can't really explain it other than I feel like I'm addicted to it. I, I love taking a sentence and seeing how tiny I can get it by, but still maintaining the, the idea or the germ of this, of the idea that started the sentence. It's, it's fun. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I don't know if all writers think that way, but I certainly find like I'm addicted to it and I can't not write. It, it would mm-hmm. really, it would really be a, a bad week if I couldn't write. Yeah. You are actually um, scheduled to come back to the podcast in March, which is cool because I don't always know that when I'm talking to people if the, if and when they're coming back. Um, but prior to that return interview or visit, however you want to phrase that, are there any of your other writings that you would like to highlight during this time? Uh, well, Bloodmark is just out. So it just came out um, on the 19th of October. So that's, that's really the one that's at the forefront of my mind. And what mm-hmm. I'm thinking about most, most this, this next book that I'm writing, um, tentatively is um, titled Ghost Mark, I probably won't be ready to, to talk very much about it at all in March. But um, the series, the gift legacy, I guess, because it was my first and, um, and still very close to my heart, all those characters. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd love to, to talk about that more in the, in the next, um, in our next get together. But one of the mm-hmm. things that I did do with that series, which um, I see a number of other authors doing it too, and is again, a cha- it was a challenge to me is I took the first book, which was Secret Sky. And I rewrote that story, that book from a different character's perspective and called it Lover Betrayed. And um, that combination of the first book and Lover Betrayed reading one after the other is a very interesting um, look at characterization and how different people can misinterpret the same uh, piece of information. Right, absolutely. Every story has at least two sides and usually more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that one particularly played off the differences between men and women in relationships, especially. But um, there are lots of things that you can ignore in a relationship until they bite you. And that's Mm -hmm. kind of what that that story is about. Okay. When you take the time to read for yourself, what are your favorite authors or genres? My favorite genre is the supernatural thrillers for sure um and in terms of my my go-to authors i'll i'll read anything that uh deborah harkness writes she's one of my favorites um charlene harris also anything she writes and i i was quite surprised i recently picked up a book in a secondhand store called um i am pilgrim by terry hayes and i was absolutely enthralled with it it's a thriller Uh, Mm -hmm. much like a Jack Reacher type thriller, um, international, which I find fascinating. And, um, and so a a thriller genre is my, would be my second. I I go to both of those genres to Lee Child. I read everything that he writes as well. I I really enjoy his characters. So that, those would be my two go-to genres and my go-to characters. Although I'll read anything, quite frankly, I I will read anything if, if someone says oh this is really good I'll, I'll give it a shot for sure mm-hmm. I know that you have um, a website so if you can share your web address as well as where people can find you and interact with you on social media oh absolutely so my website is jpmcclainauthor.com and on that website people can find connections to all my social media they can also download the first chapters of all of my books uh, in pdf format and they can join my mailing list and i i send them out a collection of short stories uh, including this new one that is uh, that i'm putting up on amazon or that that's up on amazon right now and if they want to reach me on uh, facebook it's jp mclean books and if they want to find me on Twitter, it's at JP McLean author and Instagram is the same at JP McLean author, but you don't have to remember any of that. Just go to my website and you can connect through there. 
<laughs> All right. Thank you for that. Well, um, Joanne, we've talked about a variety of different things today, but is there anything that we haven't covered that you had hoped to highlight during our time together? I think you've done a marvelous job, actually. No, I, I'm, well, I'm, I'm, I'm quite happy with all the stuff that we've been able to talk about today. I'm, I'm very, it's very nice to meet you after having some exchanges through the email world. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, well, I want to thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to talk to me um, about Bloodmark. And I'm very excited that I already know that you're coming back to the podcast. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Sarah. It's great to be here. Thank you once again to Joanne for joining me to talk about Bloodmark and some of her other writings. I'm excited to have her back in March to talk about more books. Hopefully we'll have fewer technical issues than we did this time, but you just never know, especially I never know. I seem to encourage technical difficulties in some ways. I, I blame myself. It's probably something that I'm doing, but uh, it's just it's just a gift that I have. A couple of things that I was thinking about as Joanne and I were speaking during the interview. I like to jot notes sometimes while um, I'm speaking with people. And the character of Jane in the book has narcolepsy and sleep paralysis. And of course, in her case, this these are very extreme and those, you know, they're, they're part of her her curse, her gift, what, however you want to describe it. And the, that's what she's been diagnosed with is narcolepsy and sleep paralysis. And um, I've actually had mild forms of sleep paralysis and it's, it can be terrifying. I mean, I, I, every time I thought about Jane and, you know, not being able to move and I have, I, I very rarely get it. Thank goodness. But it really, I really, you, you can't move. I have these extremely vivid dreams. Thankfully, they're not vivid like Jane's are, are vivid, but yikes so reality sometimes can be just as, as scary as the thrillers that we read and sleep paralysis not my favorite thing at one point while we were speaking joanne was talking about the character of sadie and how she's very messy and jane is a neat freak and i don't know if if joanne actually said sarah is messy or if she said sadie and i just heard sarah but i was laughing i was like how does she know how does she know that i'm the messy one in the relationship and my husband is the total neat freak and we buttheads a lot because of my messiness and his neat freakishness um she's very correct in the the relationship roles that she describes in with Sadie and Jane and I just laughed how did she know and she said Sarah is messy or I just projected and she didn't really say that and then I also thought as she was talking about her her Christmas novella that she tried to not write it so dark you know she had to she had all these ideas and they were just so dark and Really, we do expect Christmas stories to be more like Hallmark movies, right? Even when we think of um, A Christmas Carol, which has ghosts and has some scary elements in it, we don't necessarily think of Christmas movies as dark or scary. And on the one hand, I'm okay with that because I'm not usually very, I, you know, I don't, I don't do a lot of dark and scary, as you know, but... Christmas is not always happy, right? That's why a lot of churches and, and religious places celebrate blue Christmas because Christmas can be very hard for people. And so I just thought, huh, we, maybe, we, maybe we need more dark or more realistic Christmas stories. Or maybe we just need stories that help us to escape some of the, the dark in our own lives. I don't know the answer to that, but let me know. If you have, if you have thoughts on that, let me know which... Uh, Trans segues nicely into follow on social media you can <laughs> you can hit me up with your ideas about whether Christmas stories should always be happy or if they should be more realistic and representative of all of the emotions that we have in our lives let me know you can follow the podcast on social media on Facebook Twitter Instagram and TikTok and I would as I always say love to hear from you hear your thoughts also if you have not done so already if you could take a moment to hit that subscribe hit the like hit whatever it is wherever you're listening to the podcast but also to leave a review whether written or starred again just really helps us out to get the podcast to more listeners who love books as much as we do and create you know we, we can get it out to more of the book community so it would be wonderful if you could help the podcast out in that way thank you for listening and as always i hope you're having a great week and that that week involves plenty of time to get yourself lost in a good book thanks
You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.